Coming up on Diplomatic Channel, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo makes unprecedented visits to Israeli settlement in West Bank and Golan Heights. U.S. President Donald Trump accuses pharmaceutical companies of strategically delaying their announcement about a coronavirus vaccine in order to hurt Israel action efforts. And a long-awaited report says there is credible evidence that some Australian military personnel allegedly killed 39 prisoners, farmers or other civilians in Afghanistan. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Teniola Shoboale. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has toured a Jewish settlement in the Israeli-occupied West Bank, the first such visit by a top U.S. official. He also paid a similar visit to the occupied Golan Heights. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo arrived in Israel on Wednesday, November the 18th for a three-day visit to discuss regional security issues with Israeli leaders. During the Trump administration, America stands with Israel like never before. Indeed, the commitment we've made, the ironclad commitment we've made to the Jewish state uh, will continue. Uh, it was, I'm confident that after our conversation this morning, we, we talked about how we can protect Americans and Israelis in the region from the regime in Tehran. You Mr. Pompeo, who announced new U.S. sanctions on Iran while in Israel, said Washington would also step up action against pro-Palestinian efforts to isolate Israel economically and diplomatically. Thanks to your tremendous efforts to carry out President Trump's maximum pressure campaign, Iran's feet have been held to the fire, and we have seen a reduction in the amount of uh, support that they are given to their various uh, proxies in the region. Your 12 points set the standard for what Iran needs to do if it wants to be treated like a normal country. On Thursday, November the 19th, the U.S. Secretary of State paid the first visit by a U.S. Secretary of State to an Israeli settlement in the occupied West Bank in a parting show of solidarity with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu by the outgoing Trump administration. Palestinians accused Mr. Pompeo of helping Israel to cement its control over West Bank land that they seek for a state after he made a trip to Shaha Binyamin Winery near the settlement of Sagat, just north of Jerusalem. Well, I'm very angry, very disappointed, and uh, uh, Mr. Pompeo is really uh, contradicting the United States Constitution. He should have, have done it to protect uh, our property and our interests as United States citizens. Uh, instead of that, he's coming to give legitimacy to the settlers who are trespassing the privately owned land. And uh, we hope that the new administration of Mr. Biden will reverse all the steps that taken by Mr. Trump. In addition, the U.S. Secretary of State issued guidelines for Israeli products made in settlements to be labeled made in Israel, a product of Israel when imported to the United States, removing the distinction between products made within Israel and those produced in occupied territory. Pompeo reiterated his warning that Washington will step up action against pro-Palestinian efforts to tackle Israel. Today I want to make one announcement uh, with respect to uh, a decision by the State Department that we will regard the global anti-Israel BDS campaign as anti-Semitic. I know this sounds simple to you, Mr. Prime Minister, it seems, uh, it seems like a, a statement of fact, but I want you to know that we will immediately take steps to identify organizations that engage in hateful BDS conduct and withdraw U.S. government support. To Israel's delight and Palestinian dismay, Pompeo in 2019 broke with decades of American foreign policy to announce that the U.S. under President Donald Trump no longer viewed Israel's settlement as inconsistent with international law. Palestinians and much of the world regard Israel's West Bank settlement as illegal under international law. Meanwhile, the U.S. Secretary of State is not done ruffling feathers as he also visited the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights, marking the Trump administration's break with previous U.S. policies on the strategic plateau. 
President Trump in 2019 recognized Israel's claim of sovereignty over the parts of the Golan that it captured from Syria in a 1967 war and later annexed in a move not recognized by the United Nations and most of the international community. You, you can't stand here and stare out at what's across the border and deny the central thing that President Trump recognized that previous presidents had refused to do, that this is a part of Israel, a central part of Israel. U.S. President Donald Trump is a close ally of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And analysts say Mr. Pompeo's actions could be seen as a valedictory gesture before he and the president leave the world stage. Let's get more on this story from the Director General of the Bolitag Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies, Professor Bola Akinterewa. Professor, thank you so much for joining us on Diplomatic Channel. Thank you. It's a pleasure. What do you make of Mike Pompeo's visit to the West Bank settlement and the Golan Heights? I think uh, we can make two things out of it. The first one is the nature of the visit, and the second one is the timing of the visit. In terms of uh, nature of the visit, it is official, and as rightly pointed out, it is unprecedented. It is historic. However, the visit is historic, but conflict deepening and strategic in design. Why is it historic? It is historic because he is the first top official to go on an official visit to occupied territories. The opening at best very controversial up to now. It is a conflict deepening simply because Pompeo is on record to have said last year for the first time in the diplomatic history of the United States, to say that the occupation by the Israelis of um, the territories, occupied territories, acquired in 1967 as a result of the Six Day War, are not in conflict with international law. And we all know quite well that the occupation itself is very, very illegal on many grounds. You have, for instance, the United Nations Security Council's resolutions of um, um, 1979, 1980, and you also have the resolution 2334 of 2016, all of which clearly declare that um, Israeli occupation of the territories there, uh, illegal. But now, for the first time, um, Pompeo came to make a new argument and argue that it is not inconsistent with international law. So in this case, it's only deepening the crisis. The third reason why um, I think that uh, the, it is strategic in design, it is simply because Pompeo, Mike Pompeo, is already thinking of 2024. He wants to be the president of um, the United States, and he will need the support of um, the Jewish community in America. So he needs now to re-strategize in such a way now that, look, in the event uh, Donald Trump, and why not, Donald Trump will soon leave the place. If he doesn't leave uh, the White House, the White House will leave him. So he needs now to lay the foundation for a future support. So I think that um, uh, it is a visit which is mm -hmm. not simply friendly, but uh, uh, it is loaded with many strategic uh, Yeah, Professor, what's the implication of this visit for the incoming administration of U.S. President-elect Joe Biden? I think the first implication is that um, the, the visit is uh, more or less an offensive defensive strategy, primarily aimed at uh, undermining what I can call by diplomacy, 
Now they want to make by diplomacy very difficult in such a way that um, uh, come um, January 20, 2021, Joe Biden will not be in a position to easily uproot, undermine, reverse whatever Donald Trump may have done. For instance, um, the visit basically is to create or to consolidate the illegalities by history. And there is the need to sustain such illegalities. So this is a problem uh, for Joe Biden. There is also, for instance, the likelihood of trying to create a wedge between Joe Biden administration and the Jewish Americans. You see, for instance, the Jewish Americans are always pro-Israel, and it is natural. Now, Joe Biden normally would be expected to also sustain Israel, because for, for Joe Biden, Israel is not the issue. At so in this case, what we will expect uh, from Joe Biden is to manage the misunderstanding whatsoever that may exist at, at the level of uh, Israel and the U.S. Mm -hmm. the, the, the critical problem implication is just that, look, they want to sanction the supporters of a Democratic Party, all Democrats. Because when um, Donald Trump was elected in 2016, Democrats created many problems. They raised the issue of um, illegitimacy of his election and so on and so forth. So if uh, Donald Trump as that day doesn't want to concede uh, defeat, it is so clear. I think it's just say, uh, look, it's tit for tat. Now that is what is plain, uh, and that's why Pompeo will have to go to Israel and then to consolidate the achievements of Donald Trump. Yeah, Professor, taking on what you just said, Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates have established formal ties with Israel in a U.S. brokered deal signed at the White House. Sudan has also agreed to formalize relations with Israel. How would you address Donald Trump's Middle East foreign policy and what can we expect from the next administration? Well, as I've said uh, earlier, you see, Donald Trump's um, diplomacy is predicated on uh, strategic miscalculation. Strategic miscalculation simply because the United States under Donald Trump believes that there can be an enduring peace in the Middle East without factoring in the interests of the Palestinians. There will never be any foreseeable peace in the Middle East if the Palestinian question is not constructively addressed. As a matter of fact, we should be talking about a, a new constructive engagement. And that is where, in terms of uh, what to expect from um, Joe Biden's um, uh, administration and what I have described as uh, by the diplomacy, it is nothing more than continuity of um, friendship with Israel. But um, since Israel is not um, the issue, but Iran, Iran is the major uh, question. So one can expect that Joe Biden will try to engage in a diplomacy of detente, uh, reduce the tension with Iran, and then all those countries that have done agreements with um, the state of Israel uh, mm. will still be sustained in such a way that they will bring as many more countries as possible to be friendly with uh, Israel. Beyond that, Joe Biden's uh, headache is not Israel, but <laughs> Iran and all others. All right, then, Professor Bola Akinterewa, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us on Diplomatic Channel. Thank you. It's my delight. Still to come on the program.
Australia apologizes to Afghanistan after finding credible evidence that its military personnel carried out unlawful killings in the Islamic Republic. Details in a moment. Stay with us. In the United States, President Donald Trump is insisting that he won the November 3rd presidential election, even as he accused pharmaceutical companies of strategically delaying their announcement about a coronavirus vaccine because of his support for reducing medicine costs and in order to hurt his re-election efforts. Pfizer and others were way ahead on vaccines. You wouldn't have a vaccine if it weren't for me for another four years because FDA would have never been able to do what they did. What I forced them to do, and Pfizer and others even decided to not assess the results of their vaccine, in other words, not come out with a vaccine until just after the election. That's because of what I did with favored nations and these other elements, instead of their original plan to assess the data in October. So they were going to come out in October, but they decided to delay it because of what I'm doing, which is fine with me because, frankly, this is just a very big thing. So they waited and waited and waited, and they thought they'd come out with it a few days after the election. Uh, and it would have probably had an impact. Who knows? Maybe it wouldn't have. I'm sure they would have found the ballot someplace, the Democrats and the group. These corrupt games will not deter us from doing what is right for the American people. And I will always put American patients first. Our correspondent in Washington, D.C., Maria Bird, joins us now to tell us more about this story. Maria, how are Americans reacting to President Trump's allegation that pharmaceutical companies strategically delayed their announcement about a coronavirus vaccine in order to hurt his re-election efforts? Well, many Americans, um, I think, knew that this was going to probably come out after the election. I think that, you know, this uh, coronavirus has been so politicized since the beginning. And because we're right here, we were right here at the 2020 election, um, it became even more apparent that the politics uh, were going to be a play into this pharmaceutical release of the drugs. But again, if you listen to what the pharmaceutical companies are saying, if you listen to what the FDA is saying, if you listen to the scientists are saying, they're saying they moved as fast as they could. And this was not about politics. Politics is about saving American lives, and obviously it will impact the entire world. And so, um, you know, many Americans are just ready to see a vaccine. I think Americans are beyond the politics at this point. They are looking for ways to come out of the restrictions that are obviously being placed on many Americans uh, just due to the virus. And most importantly, they are tired of watching their family members and friends um, have this virus. And many of them are losing their lives or becoming extremely ill and having longer term impacts of the virus. So uh, Americans are are just waiting to see how this vaccine will move forward. I think they're very happy to hear from Dr. Fauci the other day stating that uh, this vaccine has been tested and that it has a 98% uh, probability rate of being effective. And so they are looking forward to seeing the release of this, uh, of this vaccine across the board for every American and obviously for those across the globe. You know, the president has suffered a string of court defeats in his efforts to challenge the election results. And the votes recount in Georgia has also confirmed Mr. Biden's win in the state. So what's the president's next step since he's clearly not ready to concede defeat? The president's next steps will be to try to get Republican legislators to become an alliance with him and to move forward in stating uh, that there should, there was some fraudulent activity within this election. He's going to really slow walk the process. And um, we've already seen, you know, what has happened with the removal of troops um, in the Middle East and Afghanistan. Um, and knowing that that is a region that the U.S. has been very apparent, very much present in, um, and that could potentially be a security risk uh, once a new administration comes in in January. So I think that his goal is to really, you know, I think he's in disbelief of what's happened. Again, you know, you remember he has 71 million supporters, people that voted for him, which is um, a large number of individuals in the U.S. that obviously supported his ideals, believed in him. And so he is he also getting together what his plans will be after this. And there is a potential that he will run in 2024 um, for president again. So we watch, you know, now that his son has contracted the virus, we're watching kind of his administration be deeply impacted uh, by uh, this most recent election. And obviously the virus um, has put a real damper to, I think, uh, what he was hoping to be a legacy uh, for, for his presidency. All right, Maria, but we'll have to see how everything
plays out. Thank you once again for joining us on the program. A long-awaited report has found that there is credible evidence that Australian elite soldiers unlawfully killed 39 people during the Afghan war. This comes after the Australian Defence Force released findings from a four-year inquiry into misconduct by its forces. To the people of Afghanistan, on behalf of the Australian Defence Force, I sincerely and unreservedly apologise for any wrongdoing by Australian soldiers. I've spoken directly with my Afghan counterpart, General Zia, to convey this message. Such alleged behaviour profoundly disrespected the trust placed in us by the Afghan people who had asked us to their country to help them. Australia's most senior military official on Thursday, November the 19th, said there is credible evidence that some Australian military personnel allegedly killed 39 prisoners, farmers or other civilians in Afghanistan. Australia in 2016 launched an inquiry into the conduct of its special forces personnel between 2005 and 2016 amid allegations by local media about the killing of unarmed men and children. Detailing the findings, General Angus John Campbell said the report found evidence that 25 Australian Special Forces personnel killed the 39 people outside heat of battle. The report notes that distorted culture was embraced and amplified by some experienced, charismatic and influential non-commissioned officers and their protégés, who sought to fuse military excellence with ego, elitism and entitlement. For the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, the contents of the four-year investigation are disturbing and distressing. He also says he has spoken with Afghanistan President Ashraf Ghani to tell him that the report will be taken extremely seriously. These things cannot happen again and we're very, uh, very committed to work not just with the defence forces but across the government to ensure uh, that governments can know about these things and can take actions when they should. But ultimately, these are matters that the Defence Force will be addressing through the CDF and uh, the uh, oversight panel that has been established will keep that process on, 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 the, on the track that it needs to be on and that there's an appropriate accountability there. However, the people of Afghanistan want more and are asking that the indicted officers should face trial in Kabul. <laughs> The Australian soldiers who have committed such a big crime must be handed over to face the law of Afghanistan and shall be punished accordingly. Australia has had troops in Afghanistan since 2002 as part of the US-led coalition fighting the Taliban militia. The country has about 1,500 troops remaining in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, senior Republicans and U.S. allies have voiced alarm at the announcement that a large number of American troops will be removed from Afghanistan and Iraq. This comes after the U.S. Department of Defense confirmed that the United States is to withdraw 2,500 troops from both countries by mid-January. President Donald Trump has long called for troops to come home and has criticized U.S. interventions abroad. We will implement President Trump's orders to continue our repositioning of forces from those two countries. By January 15, 2001, excuse me, I clearly am thinking of where this started in 2001. By January 15, 2021, our forces, their size in Afghanistan will be 2,500 troops. Our force size in Iraq will also 2,500 by that same date. This is consistent with our established plans and strategic objectives supported by the American people and does not equate to a change in U.S. policy or objectives. Let me start by saying that, uh, as I indicated yesterday, I think it's extremely important here in the next couple of months not to have any earth-shaking changes with regard to defense and foreign policy. Uh, I think a precipitous drawdown in either Afghanistan or Iraq 
would be a mistake. And that's Diplomatic Channel this week. Do remember to send your questions, comments and suggestions to any of the addresses showing on your screen. I'm Tenyola Shobo Ale. Bye for now.